Ladies and gentlemen, incontinence is huge. It's a huge medical problem. Over 400 million patients are suffering from involuntary loss of urine. If they would actually move into one country only, they could easily fill up the United States and parts of Alaska and Mexico as well. So let's meet. So let's meet Kathy. She's one of our patients. She wasn't incontinent all her life. She was a happy person. She actually, you know, did her sports. She went to night classes to learn more. And in the, in, sometimes she would even show off her dance moves, but then something happens. She started to lose urine. Um, she, the patients that come and see me, they tell me it is so severe that you don't want to go to the theater anymore. You are afraid that your neighbor is smelling you. They actually don't invite neighbors over anymore because they're afraid they're going to pee their pants at the wrong time. So clearly we have to do something about it. Both genders are affected, um, and you see there's a clear increase with age over time, but it's more common in women. We know worldwide every eighth woman, so one, eighth, uh, one woman out of eight will suffer of urinary incontinence. So just look around in the room, there must be many in here already. But it's not only a medical problem, it's also an environmental issue. We know in the U.S. alone, we have almost 18 million tons of adult diapers, which are thrown away to garbage every year. And if you draw that to scale, that's 7% of the garbage. Now, just think for a second, are there more baby diapers or adult diapers in this pile? So baby diapers only account for 2% of that pile. And that's actually OK. Kids will eventually learn how to control their urine, so that's no problem at all. But we have to do something about the adult diaper situation. It is so bad that the New York Times actually even had a story, the new source of fuel in aging Japan, adult incontinence. They were collecting used diapers, and they made pellets, um, uh, pellets for fuel out of them. Now, we doctors, we divide our patients in two groups. There's the urgent continence, which we all have experienced once or twice in our lifetime. You know, you head out for the grocery shopping, you drive back home, but actually you should have used the restroom back there. You didn't. So you're at your door, all two sacks on your arm, you fumble with your key, and just when you put it in your door, you turn it, you almost pee your pants, or you actually do. That's urinary stress incontinence. So, uh, this urge incontinence. The urinary stress incontinence, on the other hand, is what we see more often. And let me explain to you that with my balloon real quick. <laughs> so just envision this being the urinary bladder, and this is the outlet. So the pelvic floor is actually my thumbs, uh, my fingers compressing the outlet. If they're strong, nothing is happening. But if you had pelvic surgery, you had multiple childbirth or menopause, it weakens the pelvic floor and you start to lose urine. Now, we doctors have a lot of advice for our patients. You know, we tell them to lose weight and do more sport, but that is not that easy. Or we, we tell them to go and buy diapers. I explained the problem. We can compress the outlet, or we can either offer a complex surgeries. But that's all not helping at the source, which is actually the pelvic floor. It's a muscle that is not working right. So we believe that maybe there is some magic in stem cells. Maybe with those cells, we could treat the pelvic floor and heal these patients. Now, the discovery of stem cells is not that old. In 1960s, in Toronto, McCulloch and Mr. Till, the two researchers, they found stem cells for the very first time. They actually did some mouse studies, and one day they saw that their spleens of their mice had these weird bumps. They didn't know what it was, but what they discovered are clustered growth stem cells. And these cells opened up a whole new area of research. These cells can grow many tissues. 
Now, the power is so strong, it was uh, described by Charles Bonnet in 1780, and you really didn't want to be a salamander at that time in Paris, because he would collect all them, and he started to do experiments. He chopped off an arm, it would grow back. He actually poked out an entire eye out of its socket, it grew back with the lens. If they chop off a finger, it grows back in weeks. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, please don't try that at home. In humans, it's much more complicated. It will not grow back. Now, we all understand that we started off being one fertilized cell. We were one cell, then two, four, eight, and so forth. And these early cells are magnificent. They can actually give rise to any tissue in your body. Heck, they can actually grow an entire human being, like you and I. But the problem is that we researchers, we cannot steer those cells well enough. What happens if you would use those? They actually form a mixed cell tumor. They grow a, a tooth, some hair. If you look up there, there's even a piece of liver in it. But we wanted to grow muscle tissue. So that's probably not the way to go. If you want to bring this to clinic fast, we have to ask the patient if you can get a tissue from him. Because in tissues, there's enough stem cells to actually really do some medical treatments. There's no ethical problem. There's no uh, problem with teratoma formation, the mixed cancer that you saw. And there's no rejection because we're actually using the patient's own cells. Now, can we grow enough of those cells? The answer is clear, yes. There's even companies growing beef patties for your burgers using the same technology as we do to grow stem cells. Now, I have never tasted one of these burgers, and I'm personally definitely going to stick to beef. But maybe for the vegetarians out there, that might be a solution. But of course, it's your choice. Now, we as doctors, we don't want to grow dead meat. That is not the goal. It's far more complicated, but let me explain. May I just ask you to sit back real quick and just wiggle with your toes real. So if you did that experiment, what you did is you had a thought that went to your motor cortex, here depicted in red, the signal went down your spine, in your toes, and the muscles were activated. That is like the simplest way of a muscle activation we know in medicine. Now, in the bladder, it's so much more complicated. The bladder actually has three centers in the brain. It even has one in the spine. And there's multiple nerves running front and back uh, between the bladder and brain. So that's too complicated. We cannot replicate that. But we thought maybe we can just work on that muscle, how I showed you with the balloon compressing the outlet. Maybe we can just strengthen this muscle and actually help our patients. This is probably possible because every muscle has sort of a spare tire built in. If you have an accident, this stem cell pool gets activated and you form very beautiful new muscle with these cells. They divide, they form fibers, and they make a nice muscle. So the idea was clear from the beginning. We wanted to take a small biopsy out of the leg of a lady. Uh, it's probably about the size of a sugar cube. We then take these tissues to the laboratory. We expand the stem cells. As soon as we have enough, we would inject it back into the damaged site. Very easy steps, one would think. However, it takes years in the development. I remember really vivid, 2003, I was sitting with Dr. James Yu and Dr. Atala in Boston that we were still at Harvard at that time, discussing the possible um, ways you could use this technology to help our patients. What then followed was a full PhD here at Wake, and I'm very happy that I was able to study in this uh, institution. I went back to Switzerland, where I started an own research group just focusing on growing muscle cells for reconstruction of the pelvic floor. We had to find millions of dollars to do this in patients because it's very, very expensive. And 2019, we actually treated the first patient. Now, it took 16 years to develop this, but why? 
we had some milestones which I really wanted to take before going into my patients. One was we had to prove that these muscle, st muscle stem cells after injection actually remain at the site where we injected them. Many other studies have shown that if you inject stem cells at location A, they actually do something but then vanish. We have proven that our stem cells grow in, grow beautiful fibers, and remain at the site. Rem remember that I told you we don't want to grow hamburgers? I really wanted to see that the nerves are sprouting back in, coming to that muscle, forming this motor unit where you have contraction and everything. The red dots in this slide represent nerve endings, and we found them in the newly grown tissue. So that was a thumbs up as well. We also had to show that the muscle tissue can be grown in a scar tissue. The scar, the collagen, is depicted in blue in the background, and you see the healthy muscle cells growing in scar tissue here. And at last, we had to discuss a lot with the governmental agencies, because this is a novel technology, and we had to convince them that they would allow us to really do this in patients. So, we also had to prove to us and to others that we really uh, see a, an improvement in the muscle over time. We used MRI technology. MRIs are used in clinics on a daily basis for brain imaging or joints. They work fantastic, but they can do so much more. We actually labeled the stem cells with, with small iron particles and injected them into the pelvic floor. It should be the picture in the middle with the, the gray image uh, that you see there. And you see where the yellow uh, arrow points, there's black dots. And I'm sure you're all experts by now. You know exactly where the balloon goes. So we're actually injecting at the location where this muscle has to build up to make a better contraction. The other technology we use is fiber tracking. MRI is able to monitor water molecules moving around, and this technology is used a lot in brain activities. You can see how the brain parts talk together, but you can also use it in a pelvic floor environment, and you should see the beautiful lines of muscle fibers actually wrapping around the bladder neck in the center there. We are now using this technology for our clinical trials. Now, this video we showed to our patients before they enrolled. We told them that we make a small incision at the leg, we get this chunk of muscle out, we then bring that to the laboratory, and we grow millions of cells. We need 150 million cells. They will then be looked at in detail for security if they don't have any contaminations or so. We then go back to the pelvic floor and inject them exactly at the location where this muscle was weakened over time and is not working well. You see the fiber fuses and it forms what we hope to be a healthy muscle. Now the question is, does that really work? Did we change anything in our patients? So this is the feedback from Kathy. She wrote me after six months that she can do sports again. And other patients wrote that they don't need any incontinence pads anymore, and their, their life, the quality of life has increased immensely. So I think that's motivating. But on a more scientific note, let's look at that in more detail. Safety was never an issue. There was no infection, and the patients were really tolerating the treatment well. We were able to show that the muscle has changed. In the MRI imaging, show the thickening of muscle as we expected, but also the compressional force went up, exactly what we wanted to see. We then handed out standardized questionnaires looking at the quality of life in these patients, and all of these markers went up. The patients did really improve over time and were had less continence episodes over time. So the question now is, are we ready to treat 400 million people that way? Probably not. It's still very expensive. And even if you would ask Elon Musk to pay for all of these patients, it wouldn't be enough, I think. We still have to work on that. 
You know, we founded a company. We now have a new trial with 70 more patients where we look at different dosages of these stem cells. How many do we really need? How can we produce those cells by robotic means to even make it cheaper? And we also have to look at the elderly population because we know that the stem cells of elderly populations are not as powerful as of younger women. So we're working on that too. Overall, for this to have worked, it, we needed many teams that covered all the angles and aspects of it. We actually had three university hospitals pulled together, three universities and research teams, and a big thank you to all of them. But mostly to our patients that were willing to participate in this trial. I thank you so much for your attention.